Mooring balls look very simple and 90% of the time it is that simple. There is probably 10% of the time where it becomes a very big hassle. And it can be a hassle both to your rigging and to your hull and it can potentially damage one or both of them. We've seen a number of vessels where their hulls have been dinged up very noticeably on the front by these big mooring buoys. And let's talk about why that happened. When the wind is coming from one direction and the current is coming from another, it can cause the boat to basically work with both forces in a way that does not work with a mooring ball. If the mooring ball is here and the wind and the current are both going this way, then obviously the boat's gonna drift down from the mooring ball and our lines are gonna be attached to the mooring ball pennant line and everything's gonna work out great. No matter which way the wind starts blowing, our vessel will just change. However, if the wind is coming from, from the back of our boat, yet the current is going in the front of the boat, what will happen is that the vessel will point toward the current. And so the current's going this way, the mooring ball's here, and our vessel points toward the current because the water is going underneath our hull and pointing our hull toward the current. But if the wind is coming from our stern, then what will happen is because we have a big fat catamaran, the wind will actually pick up the wind profile of the stern of our boat and literally push us forward as the current is keeping us pointed toward the current, the wind will be pushing us over the mooring ball. And at that point, the lines get loose, the boat starts to shimmy, and you can imagine that as the wind's pushing us, and the lines get slack between our vessel and the mooring ball, what ends up happening is the boat starts to go like this, and what happens is these big giant mooring balls will start banging into uh, both inside and outside of your vessel. And in Wardwick Wells, it was particularly a big problem for almost all the vessels where the mooring ball was banging in to their vessel. Number one is Wardrick Wells, a very narrow channel. Currents are changing every six hours, and so the currents are going back and forth. No matter which way the wind is prevailing, you can almost guarantee in Wardrick Wells that within the 12 hour cycle of the tides and the currents, your boat is going to start slamming into these mooring balls. On top of that, some of us who have deep rudders could come very close to the shoal. Uh, so, what we ended up doing is we use three lines on front of our boat and we use the two regular lines that attach to either side of our forward hulls at the cleats and we bring those in and then we also then attach a third line not to the actual line, the pennant line to the mooring ball. We actually go to the shackle on the top of the mooring ball and we run our lines through the shackle so that we can pull the lines very close up to the boat. And then I take a third line, putting it again through the shackle of the mooring ball, and I bring it back to our anchor locker. And our anchor locker has a third cleat inside it. So what we have is three points of connection to the top of the mooring ball, which is right in between our hulls. And they share the load from the wind and the current, but it also keeps the mooring ball in the center of our hulls so they can never get too close in either direction to our hulls. And it shortens up the distance of our boat and anything behind it, we have a lot more room because we've now moved the boat much closer to the mooring ball and we've at the same time kept the mooring ball from banging into our vessel. And we found that a really great solution. It's a little extra work. When you use that three line technique attaching directly to the mooring ball, either on the top of the mooring ball or the shackle underneath the bottom of the mooring ball, you can't do that by leaning over the bow of a catamaran because you're four and a half feet up out of the water and the mooring ball is three feet below you. What it ends up requiring you to do is either get into your dinghy and take a line and put it in there which is somewhat difficult or frankly what I've done is tied up initially using the original technique that we talked about just using the line off the mooring ball once we get tied up to that then I'll jump in the water swim over to the mooring ball Stephanie will throw me another line that I actually put through the shackle and then I can hand her the line with her using the boat hook to bring those lines back to the vessel. Then once those lines are attached to the mooring ball, I can then get back onto the boat. We can release the mooring line that we use just to the pennant line, and then we can now pull our boat up over the mooring ball and attach those three lines snugly so that we have the rigging around the mooring ball and then get rid of the line that was through the pennant line.
We leave the North Mooring Field at Wardrick Wells and head out to the Exuma Bank. We have about 12 nautical miles to travel before we reach O'Brien's Key. Due to the shoal areas on the bank side, we need to pass Bell Island before turning north and then hug close to Bell Island on our way to O'Brien's Key. The wind was blowing around 20 knots when we left Wardrick Wells, so we sailed along the Exuma Bank side to gain some protection from the islands. However, we still got pounded by the waves on our sail to O'Brien's Key. So we are going snorkeling today. Where are we going snorkeling? Aquarium and to see a Cessna 172 that belly flopped in the bay here. Especially the aquarium has tons of fish, so we're going over there. It's part of the Exuma Parks. Should be well taken care of. And we came over here to anchor, and what did we find? Boat mooring balls. Yeah, Exuma has been so efficient that they haven't even published that they put in new mooring balls uh, last summer. Yeah, last June of uh, last year, they supposedly put in these mooring balls and I couldn't even find it on their site that these were here. So it was a very pleasant surprise. So we are now at the aquarium and we're just waiting for the current to lessen a little bit. Yeah, this is actually behind a, like a little protected area. dozens and dozens of fish down in the water here. <laughs> so it's going to be a pretty cool place it looks like. We'll see if the word aquarium is actually correct. <laughs> number two today. Snorkel number two. Plane. Let me go make sure there are no sharks for you. <laughs>
We dingy to see the sound side, using the narrow cut between O'Brien's Key and Soldier Key, and find the waves are crashing into the rocks. It was definitely a good choice to take the bank side to get to O'Brien's Key. On our way back, we make a quick stop at the beach on O'Brien's Key. Here goes, uh, something. Some sort of bird tracks down here. Can you see it? Oh, there you can see its little tail thing. <laughs> it's called his foot. People have been eating them. A bunch of uh, dead ones that with the uh, drilled out. This one's alive. <laughs> It's a short sail from O'Brien's Key to Cambridge Key. We again take the Exuma Bankside, hugging Bell Island to avoid the shoals. Cambridge Key is the southernmost island in the Exuma Key's land and sea park. A fee is required to stay at any of the mooring balls or to anchor in the park. We head to the beach near the mooring field, where we find the ridge trail that leads to the Exuma Sound side of the island. We're in the Bahamas. <laughs> We're at Cambridge Key. With all that mariners. Cambridge Key. Leftovers. It is very common to find leftover bits of trash that have been repurposed as trail markers. The Ridge Trail provides a short walk to Bell Rock Beach and spectacular views of the Exuma Sound. A nurse shark decides to hang around our boat, and Anubis is very interested in that nurse shark. Well, it's got a little more on it. Stick your toes in there, sweetie. We take our dinghy south of Cambridge Key and just to the north of Rocky Dundas. And after a little searching, find a group of coral reefs. We are drift diving on uh, what is reportedly uh, possibly the nicest reef that a few different sailors have come across this season. It is uh, basically about a half nautical mile from any land. And all we're going to do is jump in, the current drives right by it, the wind goes across it, so we're going to see whether or not this dinghy goes with the current or with the wind. But no matter what, we're going to have a line out. This line actually sinks, and I don't want it to get caught on any coral. So I put a buoy out there 
and then five feet past the buoy is the end of the line which we'll hold on to and we'll drift with the boat and then when we're done we just jump back in the boat and go home. And this is called Larry's Reef. It's right between Cambridge Key and Rocky Dundas. Join us next week when we take a short sail to anchor at Compass Key, where we visit Rachel's Bubble Bath, Rocky Dundas, and the tame nurse sharks at Compass Key Marina.